science and technology. And uh, so this, this webinar is, um, is kind of uh, our series, one of our series talks in PAP, in physics and applied physics department. We invite in a lot of uh, high profile people from all over the world, given uh, share the recent research. Uh, during the COVID-19, probably also will continue even uh, we resume the academic activities. So today, uh, Fan Jin will share with us uh, his uh, research activities, especially I believe he will also share with us his recent nature paper about this high definition artificial eyes. So biomimetic optoelectronics with nanostructure materials. And uh, probably he also touched a little bit of perovskite materials as uh, optoelectronic uh, materials. And uh, so without further ado, please, uh, Ji Yong. Thank you, Hong Jin. Let yeah. me share my screen now. Yes, go ahead. Can everybody see it? Yep. Great. Uh, thanks, David and Hong Jin for the invitation. Uh, it's been a long time since the last time I visited NTU. Um, I really miss you guys. Hopefully I can come back to NTU and uh, meet with you guys face to face. Uh, yes, in near welcome. Future. Yeah. It's uh, not under my control. Let's see. Let's see the guard. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the biomimetic optoelectronics um, using the nanostructures. So I'm actually the research was supported by the state key lab of the advanced display and uh, optoelectronic technologies uh, in Hong Kong UST. So this is the uh, outline of my talk. So in the beginning, I will briefly introduce uh, what is uh, biomimetics. Then I'll give uh, several examples of the bio-inspired nanomaterials and uh, structures or devices that give us new functionalities. Then I'll spend the most time to talk about, um, like Hong Jing mentioned, our recent work uh, using the nanowires to build artificial or biomimetic retina and eye. Okay, so what is the biomimetics? So it's actually not something new. Um, it's an old discipline, but it's uh, becoming more and more popular and also becoming an emerging science uh, and engineering. So if we search Wikipedia, what is the biomimetics? So if we search Chinese, so there's only one version of the explanation. But if we search English, there will be two words popped up. So one is called biomimetic, the other is uh, bionics. So I list out, uh, uh, I just copy paste from uh, uh, Wikipedia. So there's subtle difference between these words, but often people use them, you know, um, one or each other, you know, people don't tell you this is, there's a difference between these two words. There's subtle difference. So one was coined 1969, the other uh, was earlier, 1960. If you're interested, you can uh, look into Wikipedia and, uh, and try to learn the story. But in this seminar, so basically, uh, we consider they are the same. All right, so um, let's look at the optoelectronics. Um, what are the things we can learn from uh, the animals or nature or biological system that can give us ideas to build the optical device or optical, uh, optoelectronic devices? So firstly, look at this. this beautiful creature, the butterfly. So you, you may notice the butterfly, you know, different colors, red, blue, purple, all different kinds of colors. So I know Professor Hong Jin Fan, uh, he's a big fan of the Chinese poem. So I just copy paste one, a couple lines from a Du Fu, a very famous poet in Tang Dynasty. Um, but it's, sorry, this is in Chinese, but basically it's describe, describing uh, the butterfly, you know, um, in the maybe, uh, in the garden, you can see. All right, so what gives the color of the butterfly wings and scales? If you use a scanning electron microscope and zoom in, you look at so how the color uh, is generated on the, on the wing, and you can see there are many different kinds of uh, uh, hierarchical nanostructures, okay? So this is a scale bar one micrometer. Uh, you can see it has a fins. Well, the nanostructures in the size of a few uh, 100 or maybe tens of nanometer to a few hundred nanometers. Okay, with this kind of nanostructures, the, the butterfly scale has capability to manipulate the light. Because the sunlight, we're talking about sunlight is a, you know, a broad spectrum of light from 
uh, visibly is from 400 to 700 nanometers, we can see, right? So, um, so this nanostructure controls the light uh, transmission diffraction, then give us a color. So what is the next one? Dragonfly. So dragonfly is a very agile animal. Um, there are also Chinese poem talk about the, uh, and quite many. I just uh, also extracted a couple lines, also from the state. So describing the dragonfly, dragonfly has a big eyes, okay? Like a jade eyes. So if you zoom in under the microscope, okay, so the, just the uh, optical microscope, you can already see the dragonfly has two very big eyes over here, okay? So there are many, many small bumps over here, small domes. Uh, so this is called a compound eye. So later, I'm going to give you some detailed structure of the compound eye. Anyway, so with this pair of the compound eye, uh, dragonfly has a very big field of view, almost 360 degree. So dragonfly can see the front and also can see the back. So it's very difficult to ca capture dragonfly because you can see everywhere. So these are the animals, insects, uh, arthropods, and now let's look at ourselves. Okay, so uh, so this is a picture of a beautiful girl and handsome guy behind. You can see their eyes are beautiful, right? So these are the nurse and doctor fighting against the coronavirus to help to save our life. So of course, they are the VIP these days. So, and for you and me, uh, we're in the office, we don't need to wear the mask. But if we walk on the street, we're required to wear the mask. So how do we know each other, recognize each other? Through the eyes. Right, so our eyes are definitely very important on our face. And of course, there's a Chinese point, just one line put here. I hope Professor, Professor Fan will like it. All right, so uh, our human eye is a single eye, it's not a compound eye. Okay, so it has a delicate structure. So I have a picture over here. So th this will be the focus of the, today's seminar. So I'm going to tell you more later. Now let's, let's think about what can we learn from a, a butterfly, really. okay? So as I mentioned, the butterfly has uh, nanostructures and um, those nanostructures control the light propagation so we can get different colors. Now, the researchers already, uh, this is uh, one paper published uh, 2016 on Science you know, Researchers already build this kind of nano gyro structures over here. So this nano gyro, gyro structure try to replicate the butterfly wing structure. And that can also give you uh, the color, like a blue color or a green color, whatever color. So the second structure um, is a multi-layer structure. Okay, so it can also give you the capability to manipulate light and give you blue color. This is the structure color we learn from uh, nature. So it, in addition to butterfly, we also have some other animals like uh, feather of the pe peacock, uh, very, also very beautiful. Uh, if you look at the SEM, you can also see the micro and nanostructures. Okay, so now let's uh, look at the compound eye a little bit in a little bit detail. So um, upper left over here, so is a schematic of a compound eye. As I mentioned, it has many small eyes, okay? So in the middle, we can see one single eye. On the top, we have a micro lens to collect the light. And in the middle, we have a waveguide structure. So this waveguiding structure guides the light from the top and to the bottom, there's a photo detector. Okay, so at the bottom. So all the uh, single eyes, they're assembled and distributed um, on a hemispherical you know, substrate, or well, not hemispherical structure, they form the hemispherical structure. So it has a very large field of view. Uh, close to 180 degrees. That's for one single compound eye already. Okay, so what's the uh, what look like? Uh, you know, through this compound eye. So let's take a look. Uh, that's the bottom right corner. I have four figures, four small figures. Uh, the, the the top left. This is the original photo of a flower. Okay, under our camera, like a cell phone camera, that kind of camera. And this is a simulated. All the others are simulated. Uh, uh, the picture. You know, image by the common eye. So on the right hand side, uh, this one, this is a, this is a image, simulated image, just through a compound eye with a five cm distance. You can already see this is a pixelated, right? These are small pixels. The reason I have a pixel is because the compound eye itself has many pixels. 
So if we move a little bit further away to uh, 10 cm, you will see uh, the image quality becomes more coarse with the distance, okay? And if we even move further away to, uh, to 15 cm, it will become even more pixelated. So this is uh, uh, the world, how the world appears through the compound eye. It's different, different from uh, uh, our camera, but you see, even though it is pixelated, but the size of the flower doesn't change. That's interesting. So because the common eye has a very large um, field of view, FOV, and so it has many interesting applications. So in 2013, there's a, a research group in, I'm saying, University of Illinois, uh, Professor John Rogers group basically, published a paper on nature. So they actually used the uh, uh, photo dials photodiode array, they assemble the photodiode array on hemispherical substrate, okay? Uh, they use the flexible interconnects. Everybody knows John Roger, very famous for this uh, buckle, the flexible interconnect, right? So they build this uh, hemispherical artificial compound eye. Uh, this uh, compound eye can also recognize the uh, patterns and character projected uh, to the compound eye, uh, like uh, the picture on the right hand side shows. And we can actually learn more from compound eye. So this slide shows uh, our recent work published last year on nature communications uh, done by Dr. Chen Peng Zhang. Oh, sorry, I should have used uh, uh, English here. But anyway, his name is Chen Peng Zhang. When he started work, he was a graduate student. Now he's already postdoc here. So what did we learn from the compound eye? So as I mentioned, the compound eye has many small eyes, right? So, and the inside there's a wave guiding structure. Here we build a nanostructure or nanophotonic a light emitting dial. So on the top, we have uh, this uh, nano dome structure. So this whole architecture uh, was built on porous lumina templates. Uh, on the back side of the porous lumina template, we have uh, this dome structure. Right? So this structure is serving as a lens, the micro lens right here, okay? So then on the very top, we uh, deposit the proscan material. Uh, so to emit the light, then the dome structure focuses the light into the channel. So in the channel, we filled up with uh, TiO2, titanium dioxide, uh, nanowires. So this is titanium dioxide nan nanowires. They're serving as a wave guiding structure. So basically they guided the light down to the bottom, then emit it out. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the function of this uh, uh, hierarchical structure. Uh, of course, here is not the photo detector, it's, uh, it's a light emitting diode. We want this uh, whole structure improve the efficiency of the light extraction. So indeed, uh, if you look at figure B at the bottom right, uh, to compare the external quantum efficiency of different comp structures. So the black curve is a planar structure. The planar structure gives us the quantum efficiency around 8%. Uh, if we use one micrometer, one micrometer microstructure, we'll get um, like 17.5% external quantum efficiency. Um, uh, more than double, more than double the quantum efficiency. So this tells us this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, micro lens plus wave guiding structure can give us high efficiency um, of the light extraction for LED application. Okay, so <clears throat> another case we learned before uh, was uh, the lotus leaf. You know, lotus leaf, um, it has a very unique feature. So the surface of a lotus leaf is a super hydrophobic. So that means if you put water on it, that has a large content angle over 150 degrees, then the water will stay as a droplet move around. So if there are dust on the uh, lotus leaf, the moving around the water, they will carry away the dust and clean the lotus surface. So this is called a self-cleaning surface uh, of, of, of the lotus. So why it has such a function? If we look at the detail, uh, lotus surface is also nanostructure, has many nano cones on the surface. Um, in order to get this kind of um, uh, self-cleaning fun, we fabricated, uh, basically my, my student, uh, Hoi, he fabricated the nanostructure, PDMS, and later he also used a PFA on the plastic material to uh, make the nanocone array on the top. Then the film will have the super hydrophobicity. So the contact angle is 150, over 150 degree. And then the water can still, can also move around on the top. So we actually attach this kind of uh, uh, hydrophobic film on the solar cell uh, to uh, give the solar cell self-clean function. So the solar panel, you know, outside the door will accumulate the dust, right? 
So if we have this self-cleaning function, we can keep the cleanliness on the solar panel surface and maintain the power generation efficiency. Okay, so these are the processes. So now we're going to challenge a very difficult task, how to uh, mimic our human eye, okay? So like I mentioned, the human eye structure is very delicate. So if you look at the structure, so we have, uh, we have a iris, we have a, a pupil, we have a lens over here. So human uh, eye lens and can change the uh, focal depth, uh, focal lens, uh, because we want to see near and far, right? So behind that, we have this uh, visual body. So over here, this cavity is mostly filled with uh, gel-like material. Uh, over 90% is basically just water, okay? So on the back, uh, there's a very important, or most important part is called the uh, retina. Okay, so this is uh, our CCD or CMOS image sensor. It has many, many photoreceptors. So this photoreceptor converts the light into neuroelectric signal, then pass to the uh, optical nerve fiber, then go to our brain. Then our brain acquires this information and generate image. So this structure uh, is a spherical structure. Of course, it's a spherical structure. So after so many million years of evolution, it is a spherical structure. So we can actually move our eye in our eye socket easily. Um, on the right hand side is a, is a drawing, is an artistic drawing of the uh, artificial eye that uh, we uh, built. So I'm going to tell you more detail about it. But before I tell you the detail about it, so let's look at some uh, potential applications of this uh, artificial eye. So I myself is a big uh, sci-fi fan. So I watch many uh, sci-fi movies. I'm sure some of you also like uh, sci-fi movies. For example, I Robot, Will Smith, so it's uh, relatively old. Uh, but recent ones like uh, Western World, and you see there's a cyber the robots. They all have these vivid eyes. So really like the uh, human eyes, right? So these are the artificial eyes. And Terminator, and this is very cool looking. Some maybe a little bit scary uh, artificial eye. So of course, the artificial eye can be used for robotic and machine uh, vision in the future. But now, how important is this eye to our human, to, to ourselves? So we know we have a five senses, by the sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. So the most important sense is the sight. So our human brain acquires 80% of information through our eyes, a pair of eyes. So you know how important it is. If, you, if we all of a sudden lost the sight, we'll feel like, oh my God, you know, we're dead, basically, that kind of feeling. So, but in the world, we have roughly 3.5% um, population suffering from this uh, uh, visual impairment. So that's about uh, 200 million people. That's quite substantial, right? And in China, we have even more, like 5.5%, uh, because you know Chinese students are really studying very hard from elementary school. They, they do so many uh, homeworks, exercise, and exam papers. So that deteriorates the, the vision. And also, we always uh, have uh, spent a lot of time on the, in front of the screen. Uh, doesn't matter if it's a TV screen, computer screen, or cell phone screen. So they all hurt our eyesight, right? Um, and if you look at uh, the population trend and this uh, visually impaired population is going up so every year. So we hope there's a technology can help those people visually impaired recover their vision. So um, that's one very important application. Okay, so let's uh, look a bit, bit more detail of uh, our retina. Uh, so this eye structure I have already introduced. If you look at the, the detail of our retina structure, so on the right hand side, we have a blow up image. So it is somehow disappointing to us. Why? If you look at structure, this, right, this is a white color rod. There's a light sensing cells, photoreceptors. They are at the bottom of the retina. Okay, so they are at the bottom of the retina. And on top, they have the neuron cells to do some uh, pre-amplification signal, pre-processing of the signal. Then the neuroelectric signal will go to these uh, optical nerve fibers. You see the optical nerve fibers there on the front side of the retina. So that caused two problems. So basically problem number one, the light has to penetrate through the optical nerve fiber layer, neuron layer to reach the light sensing layer. So this penetration process already has 40% of light loss. 
That's uh, problem number one. Problem number two, since uh, all the optical nerve fibers on the front side, in order to go to the back side of the retina and, and the eyeball and go to the brain, they have to drill a hole through the retina. Okay, so a bundle, a bunch of these uh, optical nerve fibers drill a hole through the retina, go to the brain. Right? So this cause um, a blind spot issue. So at this whole region, there's no photoreceptors. So there's a blind spot on human retina. Perhaps you already uh, learned this uh, some time ago, but you didn't pay attention what's the cause of that. This is the reason, okay? But not all the animals are uh, suffering from this uh, blind spot and light loss issue. And if you look at some low level animals, amazing, cephalopods. What are the cephalopods? Like uh, squids, octopus, all these uh, deep sea creatures. So their eye structure is more advantageous. So now you look at it internally, their optical nerve fibers assembled behind the retina, okay? So then there's no such issue called a blind spot. Uh, there's no hole on, the, on their retina. So how nice, right? So and uh, the photoreceptor on the front side of the retina. So they don't have this light loss issue, uh, unlike human. We think we are really smart. We, we have IQ 200, but our eye structure is worse than the cyclopods. I don't know why, there's no consensus. I guess one of the possible reasons is evolution. You know? So like there's a deep sea creatures, they're living in the environment, the surrounding with a very, very weak light, almost no light. So their eyes must be very, very powerful. Otherwise they can't, they can't survive, right? So this is a um, natural selection, basically. Okay, so um, where did we get the idea for the uh, biomimetics of the retina? So now you look at the detailed structure. This is the cross-sectional schematic of this uh, uh, retina, human retina. Now you see the rod cell and the cone cell at the bottom, they form a three-dimensional array, densely packed array. So this triggers thinking, you know. So in the past, we grow the nanowire arrays, three-dimensional nanowire arrays. Uh, we have been growing zinc oxide, silicon, germanium, uh, can sulfide a long time ago. So this nanowire, 3D nanowire arrays are very similar to this uh, raw cell and cone cells uh, in our retina. So can we use, the question would be, can we use this nanowire array to mimic the function of the photoreceptors? So that's a question. So that's how we get the idea uh, originally. So before I, I tell you how we build this artificial retina, I want to uh, tell you a little bit background information, how we fabricate this uh, uh, three nanowire arrays. So we choose to use a template, it's a porous template uh, called porous alumina membrane. I remember Professor Fan, Professor Fan also played with this membrane before. So um, basically it's made of aluminum oxide. Uh, it's very easy to fabricate. You just dip the aluminum chip into the acid solution and also put a carbon rod and apply the DC voltage in between. You anodize the surface of aluminum and you get a pulse. It is a nano pore structure. So you can control the pore size and the pitch from tens of nanometer all the way to maybe a couple of microns, a very large range. Uh, so you get aluminum oxide and these are the SDN images. You can see the ampli pores. So we can assemble the optoelectronic materials into this pores so to realize the assembly, integration, and growth at the same time. So I personally believe this material, PEM, is a very ideal. It's ideal, the ideal substrate for the integrated nano optoelectronics because of a number of reasons. So number one, it's chemically very inert and also very stable. And number two, mechanically also very robust. And number three, it's insulated, electrically insulated. So that means whatever material up to electronic material, electronic material put inside, you won't have the shortage problem, okay? And number four, it is optically transparent. So it doesn't have these uh, uh, parasitic optical absorption issues to affect the performance of your device. So it's very good, basically. So how we grow the 3D uh, nanowire array, um, I need to thank my student, uh, Dr. Lele Gu and uh, Dr. Walid. So Lele is a postdoc and Walid right now He's an assistant professor in Pakistan. So um, Lele started work 
So he fabricated, he, he performed the electroplating of the uh, metal clusters at the bottom of the channel, through the bare layer. So then put this sample into the CVD furnace. So in the CVD, we put MEI powder inside the chip. Uh, so when we heat up, the MEI powder will evaporate and become a vapor and diffuse in the channel. Uh, we have a two-step reaction over here. So MEI react with the PB and become PBI2. Then PBI2 react with the MEI further uh, we'll get uh, MAPPI3. Uh, this is the process we get the network uh, inside, inside the porous, porous alumina template or PEN. So uh, these are the SEM images. We can precisely control the, the diameter of the nanowires, the arrangement, the ordering, and the height. Uh, so with this, we can achieve this three-dimensional uh, nanowire arrays. And this, this process uh, is a generic. So uh, because ProSky is ABX3, right? So we can change A, change B, change X, so we can get different kind of ProSky. So MAPBS3, FAPBS3, or CSPBS3, this is uh, all inorganic. Or we can replace the toxic PB. Uh, we can use the tin, we can use the Indian, we can use the bismuth. We can make uh, all different kind of exotic ProSky. Uh, there's a different composition. We will have different optoelectronic properties, different band gap different color, it depends on your application. So in 2016, uh, we published a work uh, using the, this uh, PAM uh, with a nanowire array inside. Very thin, it is uh, two micrometer thick. Okay. So we fabricate the top and bottom uh, orthogonalized electrode array and form a 10, 20, 1024 pixel image sensor. Okay. So this image sensor we attach to a PCB board and outside we have the multiplexer and the amplifier. Uh, so basically, so this is a, a photo detector array so we can project light pattern on the photo detector array. And then we can use the computer acquire the data to reconstruct the pattern. So this is a planner image sensor to verify the concept. So the planner is relatively easy to do. Okay, we just use the shadow mask, we use the nano imprint, we can make an uh, electrode. Okay, so, but the biggest challenge to fabricate artificial eyes is how can we fabricate hemispherical array of the nanowires, hemispherical artificial retina. So what are the challenges? Of course, the challenges, one is how to make this hemispherical. And the second challenge is how can we make the electrical content on the front side and the back side on the front side and the back side of this uh, a hemispherical nanowire array. And how we can assemble this uh, hemispherical artificial retina together with other components to form the spherical eyeball structure. So these are the challenges. In fact, I had this idea of artificial eye about uh, nine years ago, um, 2011, I had this idea and wrote a proposal and so me to research grant council in Hong Kong. Uh, even though I got the money, but I didn't make it work. There's <laughs> too many challenges, like I list out three already. And then, you know, we, we play with uh, PM and ProSky until 2016, and we, we, we figure out how to grow this uh, nanowires and uh, high density and the performance are okay. Uh, then we start the actual work to fabricate uh, this hemispherical artificial retina. So to, from a planner 2D to 3D hemispherical, what, what is the transition? It's actually much easier than we expected, although we spend a lot of time, but actually it's not that difficult to do because aluminum itself is very soft. Everybody knows aluminum is soft metal, right? So if we mold aluminum into the hemispherical structure, you just press it, you can do it, right? You don't need a high pressure, basically. So you have a negative, uh, negative hemispherical structure and a ball, you press aluminum, you get this uh, a bowl structure of the aluminum, right? Bowl shape of the aluminum. So this is hemisphere. Then we can analyze this whole piece of the um, aluminum bowl in the solution. Then we get uniform coating of porous aluminum surface, inside and outside surface um, of this uh, hemisphere. Then we can perform the growth of the proscan nanowires and you get a, it's a hemispherical retina or hemispherical nano array. So you see, it's much easier than we expected in the beginning. 
So uh, this picture shows the um, artificial retina. We already load in the proscan nanowire, so that's why the color is black. The material absorbs a lot of light. Uh, the diameter is uh, about a 2 cm, which is uh, almost equal to our human eyeball diameter. So uh, here is a cross-sectional SEM telling you that it is a nanoball structure. So uh, next slide, uh, well maybe next next slide, I'll show you more detailed structure. Uh, you can see the nanowires filled up uh, in this uh, artificial retina. So now you compare our human retina and uh, artificial retina, you can see the similarity already. Okay, but we want to avoid this blind spot issue. In order to avoid the blind spot issue, we have to make the contact, those um, optical nerve fibers, okay, behind, behind the retina, behind the artificial retina, so we don't have to drill a hole through the artificial retina. So in that sense, we learn uh, the structure from our human eye. We also learn from a cephalopods. We combine the merits of the both structures. So this picture, uh, this, uh, this PPT give you a full detail, let me see, full detail structure of the, um, our artificial eye. Where's my laser pointer, let me see. Well, I'm looking for my laser pointer. So um, here, figure A tells you the structure. Um, the key element is still our artificial retina over here. So on the front side, we use ionic liquid to form the common front contact. So how to form this common, how to form this front contact also, we spend a lot of time, um, a few years. So eventually, I learned from uh, this uh, kind of special solar cell called the dye sensitized solar cell. Okay. So in dye sensitized solar cell, we have the ionic liquid, we have the electrolyte as a charge transport medium. Okay? So we use the ionic liquid. Um, inside the ionic liquid, we adding a little bit of iodine. Okay? So um, this ionic liquid can seep into the pores, like here, figure E. You can tell uh, we have nanowires a few micrometers long, and on top of the nanowire, we have the empty channels. So the um, ionic liquid will enter the channel and touch the top end of the nanowire to form an interface. So at that interface will have a charge transfer to form the um, electrical current eventually. So uh, of course we have a metal shell over here to contact with the ionic liquid okay, to form a front contact. And on the back side, how are we going to make the contact? Because the front side contact is already common contact, the back side, we have to use pixelated contacts. So basically, uh, we made a socket, eye socket, artificial eye socket, uh, figure G over here. So it is made of the PDMS, it's a soft, and there are many holes on it. So this, what, what, what are we using these holes for? So basically, uh, we insert many uh, flexible metal, uh, liquid metal nerve fibers over there. So the so liquid metal, we use gallium indium alloy. So this alloy at room temperature is liquid, so it is flexible. We, we inject the liquid metal into the rubber tube, thin rubber tube, with a diameter roughly um, 0.6 millimeter, okay, roughly 0.6 millimeter. So then we insert 100, okay, 10 by 10, 100 liquid metal fibers into the eye socket and cover the uh, artificial retina or nanowire with the eye socket, then we form the 100 contacts or 100 pixels. So this is the packaging process. So by the way, we use a 3D printing method to make a mold uh, to fabricate the PDMS eye socket. Okay, so how we characterize the performance uh, of the artificial eye? First, we characterize one single pixel, okay? So very simple, just connect the front side and the back side. Um, back side is uh, the liquid metal fiber. So on um, here, the upper right corner, we have the IV characteristic. Uh, so it's basically CV, so cyclic photometry, the kind of measurement. Um, 
So this measurement, you can see that with light, we got a much higher current. So the device itself is an electrochemical photo detector. So it's working based on the electrochemistry. So the working principle, um, like I said, is similar to uh, DSSC, disensitized solar cell. So basically, um, we have a nanowire and ionic liquid interface over here. So when we shine the light on the material, okay, so ionic liquid is a, is a transparent, almost transparent. So the light can reach the nanowire. Then at the interface, well, in the body of the nanowire material, will generate electron and holes, right? So the electron move to the interface, and the electron um, at the interface will have a redox reaction. Basically, this is a redox reaction. So this redox reaction is the same redox reaction happens in the DSSC, that's in the solar cell. Then electron move to the outside, then outside carry the electron move to the other side, okay? Then being oxidized. Then uh, we'll have a closed loop electrical current, okay? So in this device, we apply the external uh, DC voltage to drive the current flow. Uh, instead of like uh, in DSSC, there's no uh, electrical, uh, electric field externally, we can still get a current. There's a minor difference over here. So how fast our um, artificial eye can respond? So and here you can see the uh, when we turn on and on and off the light repetitively, the uh, performance is quite repeatable. So how fast is the response speed? Is uh, thirty-two millisecond. Um, the, actually, the fastest one is around the nineteen millisecond. Okay, so we can tune the concentration or composition of the ionic liquid and change. Uh, the re response speed. So 19 or 30 milliseconds, it does not sound very fast. Yes, compared with a solid state device uh, like CCD, CMOS, uh, it is not very fast, but compared with our human eye, it's already fast. Our human eye response speed um, is somewhere around 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. Well, no, right? In front of our eye, if we play a movie with uh, more than 15, frame per second, then it's quite fluent in front of us, right? So because our human eye response speed is not very fast. So bottom right, uh, bottom left, uh, we're measuring the photo current versus the light intensity. So the lowest intensity you can respond is around uh, 0.3 microwatt per cm squared, uh, which is uh, maybe 0.1 or 0.2 percent of our uh, standard room light um, illumination condition. So on the right hand side, we have the spectrum response because we use FAPBS3, this material, FAPBS3. The cutoff wavelength is around 800 nanometers. So the artificial retina can respond basically from 300 nanometer to 800 nanometers. It's already broader than our human eye. Our human eye can see uh, from red to blue, right? So basically right side is 700 nanometer, the blue side is uh, uh, 400 nanometers. So the uh, artificial retina can respond to a broader range. And of course, this depends on the material we use. If we use some material with a smaller band gap, uh, for example, um, like uh, indium arsena, indium metimonide, smaller band gap material, uh, we can even extend it to a few micron range. So is it possible to uh, give human super eye like uh, a night vision, that kind of capability? Maybe. Okay, so after finish testing the individual pixels, we can test the pixel array. Uh, so this is the measurement setup. So the eyeball we mount on is a PCB board, the green color PCB board. Uh, you can see we have a 100 liquid metal fibers uh, connected with the PCB. And we have a ribbon cable connected to the multiplexer controlled by uh, the computer over here. The computer also acquires signal uh, through an amplifier. Okay, so there's a uh, analog to digital conversion over here. So uh, figure C shows that uh, we form this uh, curved image is acquired by the artificial eye, okay? And the field of view is 101 degree, 101 degree, okay? So what is the significance of this? Um, if you look at your camera, so basically here on your cell phone, if you turn on your camera, you see um, the view 
the inside the inside your cell phone camera is much narrower than our human eye. So the view of our standard cell phone camera is around 50 degree. So it's quite narrow compared with the human eye. Human eye, we have a field of view around 150 degree, it's much wider, right? So uh, our artificial eye is 101 degree. So it's much larger than the camera already. Of course, it still has the room to improve. Uh, so we're not limited by the uh, by the retina. We're limited by the lens over here. So our lens, or if we improve, we can get a much bigger uh, field of view. So here is a um, video shows the test process. So basically, uh, we use uh, a projector to project symbols uh, to the artificial eye. Then at the same time, acquired by the, the image acquired by the uh, amplified multiplexer behind and computer also acquired the signal. Okay, so because here we only use 100 pixels or 100 uh, electrodes, so the resolution is not very high, but you can see it is uh, responding. Right? Okay, so basically uh, we project the letters E, Y, E. So basically that's the meaning of I, right? Uh, we can acquire this image. So the limiting factor is a diameter of the liquid metal fiber, which is uh, 0.6 millimeter. So the pixel to pixel pitch is about 1.5 millimeter, which is quite large. Can we improve it? Of course we can improve it. I'll tell you how we're going to improve it. So, Firstly, let's look at the resolution limit. Right, so the reviewer also challenged us. The liquid metal fiber is so big and so many nanowires are connected. How can you make sure one single nanowire can respond to the light? So basically we use a focus on B to open one single pore. Uh, this is the back side of AO. We can use the focus on B to open uh, one single pore and then grow the nanowires into it. Uh, you can tell we can grow one single nanowire or multiple with the four nanowires in the channel, right? So by using the uh, electrode deposition, uh, chemical vapor deposition, then uh, we, can, we can test the performance. Uh, also here, we use the liquid metal. Uh, we use the ionic liquid. With the ionic liquid, uh, contact with the nanowires and measure the performance. So indeed, one single nanowire can still respond to the light. Of course, it's very small because the footprint is so small. It doesn't receive a lot of photons, right? Uh, four nanowires, we got a more signal. It's about uh, 12 picoam signal. Um, but this experiment confirms that one single nanowire can work as a photo detector. So how can we improve the pixel density? So as I mentioned, the limiting factor is really the, the back counter, the back counter size. One single uh, nanowire already very small, the pixel size very small. And the pitch is a half uh, micrometer. This pitch is already smaller than the average pitch of a human receptor. So on our own ret retina, human retina, uh, so the average pitch of the photoreceptor is around two to three micrometers. So our nanowire array, the pitch is a uh, half micrometer. So it's already higher density, higher definition. But how can we fully utilize this capability? It is pretty difficult because we're talking about the backside contact. How can we make high density backs of contact. So then we develop uh, another method. Um, we call that uh, micro, micro needle contact method. So basically, if you look at the figure B, so we, we made a metal nanowire array uh, on the backs of the prostate array and expose the metal nanowire array. Then on top of the metal nanowire, we insert very sharp metal needles. So this is a metal nickel, okay? So the diameter of the nickel needle um, is uh, 50 micron. So the minimum we can do is around uh, 20 something micron. And we use the electro polishing to make needle really sharp. The insert into the nanowire array, then one needle will be in contact with only three couple um, nanowires. So the pixel size is very small. And uh, the pitch will be determined by the diameter of the, this uh, nickel micro needle can be tens of the micro, which is already much, much better than the uh, liquid metal fibers. And how did we assemble this uh, 
eco micro needles on the on the device. We actually use uh, the magnet, so we magnetic field the line to um, stand out all the micro needles and attach them to the nano array. So after we turn on the field, oh, actually I have uh, over here a short video. Okay, so you can see we have a needle array already. So once we turn on the ele um, electric field or magnetic field, the needle will be attracted and fixed on the nano array. So this is a planar case. Okay, so then next step is we pull the uh, epoxy to package uh, and fix all the micro needles. Now we can get a high density of the back contact. So what kind of density can we get? So we made a very tiny um, image sensor with the size of a two millimeter by two millimeter, which is roughly the same size of the CCD, the CMOS, CMOS chip of our cell phone, okay? And here you can compare. So this is the coin, so the size of the coin is about this large, okay? So our device is in the middle, inside this small window, okay? So inside small window, we put the ionic liquid. And in this case, uh, we use a copper wire, very thin copper wire as an electrical contact. And so we also mount on the PCB and we can test it. So this is a test setup. And uh, we, we can see the response quite uh, repeatable. And on the bottom right is the image, letter of E image uh, by this uh, mini camera. So this image size, the whole frame size is a two millimeter by two millimeter. So it's very small two millimeter by two millimeter. Uh, we can still do the imaging. Uh, of course, because we use a manual way, we manually assemble all these uh, micro needles. So we, we couldn't put in more needles. But here we still use a 100 needles, 10 by 10. All right, you may ask, so how about, how can this uh, magnetic alignment method work on these uh, um, artificial, uh, hemispherical artificial retina? So this is uh, uh, showing you this video basically. So we turn on the magnetic field and you can see all these uh, uh, nickel wires, they can stand pretty well, pretty firmly on this uh, hemispherical ret retina. So if we lower the voltage, they are kind of shaking, right? We just need a little bit of voltage, we can fix it. We don't need a very strong magnetic field. They can already stand pretty well vertically uh, on top of this uh, hemispherical retina. So this magnetic assembly method is uh, it's quite effective. So how did we come up with this idea? So one of the asked us whether you can use a self-assembly method to make the content into high density. Then uh, we thought about it for quite a long time, uh, a few months, and uh, one day somehow I my, I got a I got a hint from somebody. So we can use a magnetic field to help uh, with uh, assembly. Now here it is. So still, uh, if we just put uh, all the uh, all the micro needles uh, so manually, so it's a very low efficient, right? So how can we do it in the future with high throughput? We have to use uh, robotic arms. So nowadays, uh, robotic technology is already very advanced. So if you search online, you can easily find some robotic arms uh, with moving precision of a few micrometers. So with this kind of uh, uh, robotic arm we can assemble. We can program it and assemble high density of the micro needles uh, on the hemispherical device. Okay, so uh, about uh, the uh, technical details of uh, the artificial retina. So what are the future applications? So obviously one application is for retina implant. So, uh, basically this market is really, really big. There's pretty much only one company in the world, in USA, uh, doing this business. Um, so they are making the array of the microelectrodes and attached to our human and try to use that to stimulate the uh, neuron cells and generate neuroelectric signal. But the resolution is very poor and also the cost is very high. One unit is about, uh, um, one unit I think is uh, about one million home dollars. So divided by five will be Singapore, Singapore dollars. Okay, so this market is very big. So because the nano array has a much higher resolution, so we can put it either in front of the retina, it's called 
epiretinal implantation or behind the retina that's called the subretinal implantation. So we will have a chance to uh, stimulate the damaged photoreceptor and generate the replacement photo, uh, photo, uh, photo signal or neuron electric signal and pass through the brain. So optical electronic applications are also very important. Um, on the upper right is a curved uh, image sensor made by Sony. It's not in the market yet. Right? So the, because the curved image sensor has a um, broad, broader field of view, right? So people want to use it on next generation cell phones or other devices, the camera, etc. So how did they make it? They made on um, they made a very thin layer of the uh, CMOS image sensor on a silicon wafer. Then they peeled off. Uh, of course, they have a sacrificial layer. Then they peeled off this uh, uh, image sensor layer. Then mount this thin layer onto a curved plane. So originally it was flat, and you mount it on the curved plane to make it in the curve. But the curvature, the curvature radius cannot be very small. Otherwise, you have a rumble on the side. Then your device will fail to work. Basically, uh, this is the idea they're still trying. I, I didn't see it in the market yet. So our strategy obviously is different. Our strategy is we directly mold uh, this uh, hemispherical substrate. In fact, we can mold into any substrate, any shape of the substrate, hemispherical, parabolic, or whatever you want, right? Because it's aluminum, very soft. So our strategy is different. Um, this kind of camera can be used, of course, for super large field of view camera and machine vision, et cetera, in the future, okay? So I've been talking about for already close to one hour. I want to give a summary. Um, so the first summary is that the biomimetics that can give us new ideas to design the novel optoelectronic devices, uh, photo detector, image sensor, um, LED, solar cell, etc. If we are open-minded enough, you know, we will get a new ideas, many new ideas. And the biomimetics, you know, we should. Uh, combined with the science, engineering, and the aesthetics at the same time to uh, make the system not only work, but also beautiful, okay? It, after all, the mother nature is beautiful. So here in the middle, we have a word called the B-O-E-N. So that represents biomimetic optoelectronics with nanostructures, Bowen, basically. The summary too is uh, more technological, right? So I demonstrate that we use uh, the porous alumina substrate. Already, we have done a lot of things on it, um, including uh, these uh, image sensor curved or planner. And we also use it for gas sensor or some something else. Uh, there's huge opportunity over here. Okay, so I invented this term called the opto electronics and electronics on uh, nano porous substrate. In short, it opens. Okay, it opens because I think it opens a lot of. Uh, solutions, opportunities for us to make novel device. Right? So BOE and Bowen basically tell us what should we do? We should learn from Mother Nature, got inspiration from Mother Nature, and because it is already uh, being, it has been evolved for many, many years, millions, billions of years, right? So it's been optimized already. So it solved what to do and why to do problem. Okay. And with opens, so this is about the uh, implementation how we can do it. So this with a nanopower substrate give us a platform to achieve the growth, integration, assembly at the same time. So this is the second part of my uh, summary. So with that, I want to end my talk and uh, thank my uh, students. So we typically have uh, 15 to 20 students. Um, half of the group is working on the optoelectronics. The other half working on the electronic nodes. This is also a bio-inspired device. And I also want to thank the uh, Sticky Lab uh, at Hong Kong University. Our director is uh, Professor Chin Tan. Uh, he invented the OLED a long time ago. Uh, we're waiting for his Nobel Prize right now. So um, in the Sticky Lab, uh, so we do the light emission material device uh, and the display and the PV photo detection and also sensor technologies. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Now I'm open for questions.